Van Narapile Vene Shoya Zote, the Dorote of Mea, Chaf Pierce to the Rote. See you. Yeah, I've been a party member for over 20 years. I've been a candidate, an activist, and a state chair. I'm currently an at-large member of the National Committee, um, which is the, the board that oversees the National Libertarian Party's activities, 17 people. Um, so I was, I placed second out of the, uh, the five at-large members at the last national convention, so I'm nearing the end of, of a two-year term on that. I'm also chair of the DC party, where uh, we do lots of fun stuff, like run candidates against uh, a disappearing Republican Party in the District of Columbia. Um, I, ra I ran for Attorney General this last round for ballot access, and my husband ran for council chair. Uh, he got 18,000 votes, I got 16,000, so we know which of us is more popular. And uh, we both got more votes than Donald Trump got for president in 2016, which Yes, it's a low bar in the District of Columbia, but it's one that we had to meet, and I'm uh, beat, and I'm glad we beat we beat it. Yeah, well, I mean, I'm running mainly on my vision for the party, building it to win, the experiences that I have, running organizations, building organizations, serving on boards that can bring to bear on that. Um, my management expertise, my fundraising background, um, as well as my long period of time in the party that that, that brings to it. But uh, you know, as you mentioned, I am openly gay, and uh, and honestly, I think that does bring a perspective. Uh, it's it's a a, a uh, audience that I think is naturally libertarian. Um, it certainly is with us on a lot of the social issues and where we stand and uh, I think it maybe needs some convincing and some work on uh, some of the fiscal issues but uh, you know I obviously I have a lot of a lot of gay friends and a lot of gay libertarian friends and uh, you know I, I I think it's important that they they have a voice at the table too um, you know it being gay I think has uh, helped teach me how to listen to other people and how to challenge other people when, when need be and and how to uh, be tolerant of other perspectives. So, you know, on the National Committee, I've been able to work across caucuses to achieve a lot of the different results we've been able to do, like balancing the LNC budget two years in a row, getting resources for on-the-ground infrastructure, um, helping uh, resolve some of the differences that, that we've had personality-wise. And uh, so, you know, I, I think libertarians generally are national, natural coalition builders, and I think uh, gay libertarians even more so. To win, um, my my dream, what I what what really animates me, because you know, I'm a, I'm a lawyer, I got a day job, I, I have a lot of, um, you know, I've got a good family life, and and. So, so why am I spending time doing this? Why, am I, why, do, why do I spend time on the National Committee? Why do I spend time building up the DC party? Um, it's because I'm impatient and I'm anxious because every day there's decisions being made in school boards, in city councils, in state legislatures, in Congress without libertarians at the decision-making table. So, uh, and oftentimes they're bad decisions when you don't have libertarians at the decision-making table. And in my day job, because I go around the country working for better tax policy, lower taxes, less intrusive taxes, less burdensome taxes, I've seen the difference there is when you have a libertarian at the negotiating table. I was just in Indiana yesterday talking with Mark Rutherford, who's on uh, an appointee on a, on a state board of five people that oversees spending on um, public defenders. And the stuff he's been able to do as just one of five members is incredible towards ensuring a better criminal justice system, a fairer criminal justice system, one that, that's focused on stuff on violent crimes rather than on other stuff, and, and, it, and it's just great work. Um, you know, I know I, I, I talk a lot with Jeff Hewitt, who's one of five members of the Riverside County Board of Supervisors in California, and um, there's a lot of power given to county supervisors in California. It's basically complete control over health and welf welfare spending and pension spending for their county. And 
Jeff's one of five. There's a Democrat on there. He tries to reach out to the Democrat. And then if they're ever voting together on something, they just need one more vote. And what they do is law. So we're natural coalition builders, libertarians. We understand the right in the way the, le the left never will. And we understand the left in the way the right never will. And uh, you, I really do honestly believe you put a libertarian on every government entity in the country and you'll see transformational policy. So how do we get there? Um, which, which goes back to your question. Uh, a lot of us just focusing on winning those elections and finding good candidates, making sure we have good training, good support staff, people who can be campaign managers and campaign treasurers and know how to do it, getting the tools and the resources and the infrastructure to be able to do door knocking and phone banking and all these. We have so many libertarian activists who want to help out with these things, but we don't have the programs in place to be able to match the people who want to do it with the need where we have it. We do have a pilot project going on in some of the Mountain West states where we're practicing with candidates have to raise their own uh, resources, their own campaign spending, but we're deploying canvassers and phone bankers and services and, and strategic help. And I think it's going to make a big difference in getting being able to elect people. And then here in Pennsylvania, where we are right now, uh, you know, they elected 40 local libertarians last year just through a focus strategy on that uh, with a little bit more resources and a little bit more time and a few more candidates I could see them doubling or tripling that and more to the point I think we could see taking that strategy and applying it on, in other states as well and once we're, con we're consistently electing people to county supervisor to school board the city council to state legislature and then and then increasingly to Congress and and then maybe even higher than that I think we'll dispense with this, you know, oh, libertarians, they don't win elections, because we will be. Well, in my defense, I live within the Beltway and I'm based within the Beltway, but my work carries me all over the country. So over the last 10 years, I've testified or presented to officials in 36 different states. On a given week, you'll find me in a state capital somewhere. So before I was in Pennsylvania, I was in Indiana. Before I was in Indiana, I was in Maryland. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm always out there in, in the states working on different proposals and different tax ideas out there and meeting with local libertarians. So uh, it's mainly a home base for me, uh, as well as a place to be. D.C. is a very transient city. But honestly, it's also a city that's very open to the libertarian message. Um, libertarians get... 90, 92, excuse me, Democrats get 90, 92 percent of the vote in the District of Columbia, which gives us an opportunity to be able to gin up support for libertarians. So uh, we had a lot of Democrats vote for us in 2018 just based on the message of, um, you know, do you really want this to be a one party town with the associated corruption and, and other problems? Um, I, th I truly think libertarians can win anywhere. It just comes down to the right messaging. And, you know, in, in the District of Columbia, it's, we're talking about crime, we're talking about education, we're talking about transportation, we're talking about corruption, we're talking about housing, um, because those are issues where 80% of the population is with us, whether it's Democrat or Republican or whatever, and we can successfully solicit that. Um, in other places around the country, the messages will be different. The principles will be the same. It's just a question of how we emphasize it and how we present libertarian solutions to people's ordinary, everyday problems. Now we have the ideas, though, and we have the principles. Um, and, you know, a big thing that I want to do if I do get elected national chair is setting up opportunities to do lobby days and protest days. Um, it amazes me how few people continue to, uh, and not just libertarians, generally, Americans generally, don't go and visit their legislators or their council members on issues important to them, or don't email, or don't write, or don't call. That stuff really matters. Because when somebody takes the time to actually show up and lobby somebody, um, lobby their state senator or lobby their council member, um, it, it makes a difference because in their politician mind, they're assuming everyone showing up represents 100 other people or 500 other people. So, you know, I've, I've put together lobby day visits in the District of Columbia where we bring six or seven people. But you bring six or seven people to a council member on issue, they think 
eighty percent of the people are there. That's their perspective, and uh, and we've seen. I mean, we've we've flipped votes around. We've helped change stuff, and uh, I honestly think we just need to kind of create the tools. Libertarians want to do this stuff. They want to carry signs outside of the state capitol on important issues. They want to go office to office fighting for better policy. Um, it's a little scary to do. And it's, if, if you've never done it before, it, it's certainly a, a, a big uh, a, a obstacle to overcome. But um, I want to be able to do that. And we have a big opportunity to, to be able to do that. Um, you know, there's issues of nationwide scope uh, licensure reform, where people can't do their job without getting government permission to do it. Uh, I mean, there was a joke last year that how Santa Claus would need permission from, I don't know, like five different government agencies to be able to deliver presents. And, um, you know, there's, there's model laws in every state to reform that. Uh, Laura Epke, the former libertarian senator in Nebraska, has championed those in those states, and she's willing to go state to state to help do those laws in other places. We just want to build the infrastructure so that states can take advantage of that. Because, uh, you know, I, th I think states and local affiliates and, and activists are willing to do this stuff. They just need a little bit of direction and a little bit of opportunity. And it's not forcing anybody to do anything they don't want to do, but just creating the opportunity for people to do it. Uh, I'd offer focus on winning elections. So, you know, we're trying to do so many different things in the Libertarian Party, many of which are very important things. So, you know, ballot access is an important priority. Membership services is an important priority. Um, providing support to our affiliates is an important priority. Putting on the national convention is an important priority. And um, when you try to do five or 10 or 15 different things at the same time, things can suffer, especially if you are not committing the staffing resources, the monetary resources, the management focus to it. So, I mean, I've built out fundraising organizations, I, uh, teams. I've built out marketing strategies that have been successful at, ch at moving the policy needle. I've built out um, legal programs that have won cases for taxpayers. So it's, uh, it's a matter of applying that to be able to create the infrastructure to be able to do all of these things at the same time. Part of it is just honest goal setting. Libertarian National Committee does not really engage in a strategic planning, goal setting process. Um, I, you know, I, I did that all the time for projects I would pitch to donors. And there's lots of donors who want to invest in the Libertarian Party, but need to be pitched on that we know what we're doing and that we're going to be able to track success, we'll be able to invest to reinforce success, and um, that they're, they're not just kind of throwing money down a rat hole. And, uh, you know, it doesn't take a lot of work to do that. It does take some work. Um, a lot of it, I think, is wrangling the LNC, uh, which can sometimes not always agree with each other, but in a way that can set a common direction uh, on at least the important priorities that we have. So, you know, if membership is an important goal, what are we trying to achieve with it? Or if fundraising is an important goal, what are we trying to achieve with it? Or if re-electing libertarians is an important goal, how do we go about doing that? Um, and I think a lot of it is just providing those tools and resources, the databases, the, the technology tools, and honestly, the, the training and the know-how. And we have all this stuff. Uh, it's written down, it's developed, uh, it's just a matter of delivering it in an efficient way and making sure that uh, we're keeping up on it and that we're, we know what we're trying to achieve, we're tracking it, and we're following up where we need to. No, it's a great question, and you know, even in my term at, on the LNC, we've encountered some of these situations that have been crisis. Um, I'm an outside counsel, so I'm a lawyer that other lawyers call when they have problems that they can't solve. Um, so every time my phone rings, it's a crisis that has already elevated up the way, and you know, when stuff hits the LNC chair's desk, it's the stuff that the staff couldn't figure out, that the executive director couldn't figure out, and that now it needs to be elevated up to it. And, you know, President Eisenhower had a very good system. Everything went in the boxes of urgent and important, urgent and not important, not urgent and important, and not urgent and not important. And, you know, that tells you what you need to solve immediately, what you need to de delegate, 
what you need to figure out next week and, and, and that kind of stuff. So, um, you know, I do this in my day to day. I've done it for years. Um, I've we when I had my last organization, when I worked for a nonprofit organization, we had a terrible front page headline story from USA Today, full of lies and, and misrepresentations and absolutely devastating for the organization. And, you know, we went to work. We called in as many people as we could, uh, worked our way up the food chain, and we got the biggest correction in USA Today's history, got them to pull the story from the website, issue a big thing, and, and uh, you know, it, it's just crisis management is getting on top of it, make it, keeping a cool head, not, I mean, we could have easily just like denounced USA Today and gone nuts and everything. I'm not gonna do stuff like that. It's important that the chair have a measured response, but be firm and get results. And, uh, that's what I've done my whole career, and I'm up for the challenge. We don't get a fair shake from the media. We don't get a fair shake in debates. We don't get a fair shake on a lot of different stuff. And, um, you know, whining about how we deserve it is one thing, uh, but actually battling for it is really important. And uh, it's something a lot of state parties do very good. They bring in uh, our, our LNC outside counsel to, to fight for them on, on fairness, and we sometimes even win on it. Uh, I want to do more on litigation because I think we can be more proactive on that. Uh, but a lot of it is making sure that when we interact with reporters, we're giving them what they need to sell the story to editors. A good hook, a good story, something newsworthy. And, uh, you know, I, I got a lot of, I, being in D.C., I know all the, a lot of the political reporters for a lot of the different newspapers. My office is right next door to Fox News D.C., C-SPAN. I walk past CNN on the way there. Uh, I had lawyers, or excuse me, I had reporters at my wedding uh, just because they're, they're friends of mine. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to do what I can to use my Rolodex to make sure that, that we get the best press that we can for our presidential candidate, for our state candidates, for uh, everybody that's running. I really hope they would win. They, I mean, they did get four and a half million votes. and and create a sense of momentum for us. But yeah, we need to continue capitalizing on that momentum. We can't let that be a one-time flash in the pan and then have us return to half a percent and losing ballot access all over the country and not feeling like we're making progress on a world set free in our lifetime. Now, your question of kind of how, how do we do it, a lot of it's gonna be up to the delegates in their decision on who our presidential nominee is. So, I mean, you have presidential candidates offering different things. Uh, one of them is offering, you know, if you nominate me, I'm going to focus on getting a whole lot more members. And so that's her message. Or there's another presidential candidate that says, you know, I'm going to defend principle. And I'm going to go and, you know, say what, what needs to happen to government spending and government programs and everything. And that's going to be my message. And then there's other candidates that want to talk about uh, kind of the issues of the day or, or the war or health care. Um, all that's important stuff, and you know I, I do trust the delegates to decide which path we want to go, and it's incumbent on the chair and the national staff to reinforce those efforts and reinforce the messaging, making sure that we're staying principled, but we are also offering stuff that answers er people's everyday lives. Um, people are going to be politically homeless after the Democrats and Republicans finish their nomination. I, you know, I don't know who the Democratic nominee will be, but I think they're alien. They're going to alienate, you know, a third to a half of their party, depending on who it is. And then on the Republican side, yeah, a lot of Republicans, most Republicans love Donald Trump right now. But there's a lot of people who quit the party over the last couple of years. So in D.C., where I'm the, the local party chair, our registration's grown 80 percent over the last two years at the same time that the Democrats have been kind of even and the Republicans have plummeted. And you know that's just DC, but I hear that's a similar story happening all over the country. And so there's a lot of opportunity for us to capitalize on that. Um, finding a way to be welcoming these people, not so they can change who we are or change what we believe in, but for people that do care about liberty, who do care about our principles, who do care about um, smaller government and fighting for individual rights and the non-aggression principle and all the things important to libertarianism. Um, you know, we, we want them to be home and let's see if we can build a, a majority that, that gets the job done, that creates a world set free in our lifetime. In order to do all that, we need a working national infrastructure building our party to win. And that's why I want to do a state chair, or a national chair. I'm already state chair, national chair.
Winwithjoe.org. See you in Austin.